The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily represent those of any organization, including one generation away. America is free. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of enterprise, and freedom is special and rare. This is Liberty Nation with Mark Angelides, a production of LibertyNation.com, going after what the politicians really mean and making it all clear. For your freedom and your liberty, Liberty Nation with Mark Angelides. A new year dawns, and with it, the hope for something better. 2021 was, for many people, a washout. It seems that the year was marked by COVID restrictions, anti-liberty legislation, and above all else, numerous attempts to weaken the founding documents of the United States. But fear not, for the budding new year, we each have the opportunity to once again set the world to rights. In the fourth century BC, the oft-called father of history, Herodotus wrote these words, quote, It is better by noble boldness to run the risk of being subject to half the evils we anticipate than to remain in cowardly listlessness for fear of what might happen, end quote. And dear listeners, as ever, that is what it takes to create the type of world you want, courage to face our fears and noble boldness to take the risks that have instilled said fear. Herodotus was right two and a half thousand years ago, and he's right now. Or perhaps we should consider the words of the philosopher and statesman Seneca, who said, he who is brave is free. And in this time of making resolutions, I think this could be the best goal of all. For freedom, although it can be fleeting and must be constantly reinforced, is the most noble goal of all. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what we're going to talk about today. Welcome to the Liberty Nation radio show here on the Radio America Network. I'm your host, Mark Angelides, and I'm here to wish you the very best and bravest Happy New Year for 2022. On today's special episode, we're figuring out the economic game plan and whether America can survive another year of President Joe Biden. We asked Joe Schaefer which way the America First movement is heading. We have longtime host of Liberty Nation Radio, Tim Donner, presenting the very best of our signature Say What segment. That's one for the ages. And of course, as always, Scott Cassenza is talking liberty and detailing the big cases for the coming year. I'd like to take a brief moment to say a special thank you to our listeners out in Cadillac, Missouri on WATT, 1240 AM and 106.1 FM. Happy New Year and thanks for being part of the team. Remember, this show is proudly sponsored by LibertyNation.com, where you can access podcasts, breaking news, analysis, and a range of biting and brilliant shows to whet your appetite for freedom and your fondness for the great American Constitution. Well, it's a brand new year with plenty of things to look forward to and a chance to wipe the balance sheet clean, or so hopes the current administration. Congress has passed a number of bills, each of which seem certain to add to the mounting American debt. And while Republicans must shoulder their fair share of blame, it's ultimately the president who steers the national bus. And folks begin to ask themselves the all-important question, can America afford another year of President Joe Biden and his expensive and expansive policies. Well, there's no one better place to answer that particular quandary than author and economist, Mr. Andrew Moran. Welcome back to the show, Andrew. Thank you for having me. So what's the deal? Can the average American look forward to a better or worse financial year for 2022? Well, just, just as a side note, when it comes to your opening uh, promo, uh, the Federal Reserve, I, w- I wish they would wipe out their balance sheet and, you know, <laughs> all of my economy. But yeah, for your other question, according to many of the surveys, uh, the most recent one came from the uh, Federal Reserve Board of New York, the Survey of Consumer Expectations. And th- <laughs> Everyone is bearish in the economy right now. They're looking ahead to 2022, and they're seeing 6% inflation by the end of that time. They're looking ahead to 2027, and they're expecting you know high inflation still. They're, they expect their, their financial conditions to worsen. Wait, so I no. thought inflation was transitory, Andrew. I thought it was merely transitory, not five years plus. Hey, man, hey, they, they retired that word now. So that, that word is stricken from the record. <laughs> but overall, yeah, and, and no one is expecting a positive year uh, in 2022, perhaps not even in the stock market, now that the, the Fed might remove the uh, spike punch bowl from investors. Okay, I mean, it's often said that uh, the inflation, it's a tax on all living things. It's the creeping expense that devalues what you already have and makes it harder to stay ahead of the game. Um, how much is the average voter impacted by this 40-year high inflation animal? 
Oh yeah, dramatically because it, it, just look at the the main the main two components of the CPI. That's food and energy, which is why they have the core inflation rate, which removes those two. But anyway, so those are they account for the, uh, most con- households' budget. So you look at food. Food overall, the food index is, is, was up uh, more than six percent in November. If you go within that, everything was up across the board. Uh, uh, apples, bananas, meat, dairy, eggs. Those account for large aspects of the average American's kitchen. So that's going to hit. That's going to impact their, their wallets considerably. Energy, gasoline is up thirty eight percent. Electricity is up six and a half percent. Natural gas has been up, you know, fifty percent over the last year. So everything is costing more to the consumer, and that impacts them greatly. No matter how many people, like Paul Krugman, contend that high inflation is it doesn't impact low and middle income people, that's completely preposterous. That d- d- diminishes their purchasing power, makes everything cost more, hurts their their wages, cost of living skyrocket. So no, so they're, 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 they have, they're gonna have a bad uh, or a rough 2022 and perhaps even 2023. I think the uh, the question that everybody wants to know is how about Tofurky? <laughs> hey man, hey, that costs. Uh, I think I think up here in Canada, uh, I think it's thirteen dollars for uh, for about probably about this size of a Tofurky. That's uh, that's thirteen dollars too much, Andrew. Now, without giving anyone actual advice, Andrew, in what ways have folks over the years shielded themselves against rising inflation? Well, uh, I spoke to a market strategist the other day, and he was telling me that uh, over the last year, many investors have tried to shield themselves from inflation by doing a few things. So a lot of them have poured in, into equities. They, a lot of them bought REITs or excuse me, real estate investment trusts where you know, you're know you buying an income uh, generating uh, investment fund that invests in property. Uh, a lot of them actually even uh, delved into cryptocurrency. According to, according to this strategy I spoke to, uh, he was telling how a lot of uh, investors have swapped gold and silver for crypto, like Bitcoin and Ethereum to, you know, as because uh, those that uh, they function as deflationary uh, investment tools since they've skyrocketed, I think what 40, 50, 60 percent over the last year. So, those, 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 are, those are a lot of things that, that people are doing to shield, them, to, to shield themselves in a higher cost of living and to protect their assets. If you go into a savings account, you're just throwing money away because the real interest rate is negative considering the high inflation and the uh, near zero interest rate. So, if you're just putting money in a cash account, no matter, you know, matter if it's an online savings account that provides a higher interest rate, you're still losing money. So, you have to go into the stock market to, to, to uh, help protect your, your capital. And that's what's, that's, and that's, that's, the, that's one of the chief, chief goals of a low interest rate environment for central banks, because the lower interest rates, you just have to go into uh, the stock market. Although I will, I will say this, what's interesting in Sweden, because they, they were one of the first countries to have you know, uh, sub-zero interest rates. They wanted people to go into the stock market, but what the reverse happened where consumers were actually putting money into their microwaves and under their, under their mattresses, because they viewed that a negative interest rate environment is is uh is a sign that you know the economy is in the downturn so that's how they protect their their income and is the united states heading into negative zero territory at any point in the future Probably not because how high inflation is. There's a lot of expectations that the the central bank is going to begin raising interest rates uh, as, as late as, or as early as June of next year to help quash inflation. Uh, if you remember the 1980s when Paul Volcker, when he when he was helming the Federal Reserve, he dramatically raised interest rates to as high as 20 percent because because uh, inflation at the peak was at 15 percent. So by you know raising interest rates, that takes you know money out of the economy, which is one of the chief factors of inflation. You want you want to have less money in the economy so prices start coming down. Because because when because when when in this market you have excess capital and that therefore people are chasing too few goods with more money. I'd like to act as a Cassandra for us and foretell the future uh, using your economic analysis and tools. So cast yourself forward to 2023. What will folks be talking about? What will we be talking about one year from today? Well, inflation. I mean, I know we're beating a dead horse, but inflation—that's going to be the, the chief topic for the next over over the next twelve months. All the survey of economists, all the surveys of consumers—they all say the exact same thing. Inflation is 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 a, is a perhaps a permanent fixture of the post-COVID economy. When the Fed is printing, because look at the Fed. The Fed—they—they're now saying tapering, correct? But the problem they're tapering is they're still adding. I think about two hundred billion dollars to to the balance sheet over over the next six months. So that's more money being put into. It, more 
money being put into the economy. So that's creating more of an inflation. While the supply chain crisis reports I've seen, a lot of experts say that this isn't going to subside at all in 2022. Um, if you look at the the LA or the California ports, a lot of these ships are extending at a, a, at a record high, extending into the Pacific Ocean. So right there, you have the issue. China, they're having these quarantines because they're trying to have a COVID zero strategy. Therefore, these ships are, 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 at, are at an all-time high stuck at the Chinese ports. So you're having this back and forth issue where one side has, has a huge jam, another side has a huge jam. So that's also going to add to inflationary pressures. Another thing, employment costs. Employment costs are expected to go up again because of, of, the, of the excessive number of job openings there are, too few people taking these jobs. You have the record record number of uh, quit rates. I think it was 4.2 4.2 million uh, in in, uh, in October. So that's not, so you have employment, you have supply chain crisis, you have a monetary expansion, fiscal spending. Biden is not showing any signs of all these slowing down the fiscal expansion at all. So you have, you have, a, you have a, all these factors that are going to add to inflation pressures. And I doubt it's going to subside at all in 2022. So next time you and I talk, if I'm still alive by December 2022, we'll be talking inflation again. And then you're going to ask me, what's, what's going to happen in 2023? I'm going to say, well, probably inflation. And we'll see how much we've got stashed away on our mattresses then. Andrew Moran, thank you ever so much. Thank you for having me. Now, don't go anywhere. Later in the show, we're looking at the major cases coming up in 2022 on our Talking Liberty segment. We also have a special New Year's Say What show with longtime host of this here Liberty Nation Radio, Tim Donner. But after this short break, we'll be right back talking with Joe Schaefer on what lies ahead for the future of the America First movement. freedom and your liberty liberty nation with mark angelides who will win the battle for hearts and minds of the voters in the coming year one thing is for sure when the dust settles the swamp will still remain but which faction will be the dominant one Longtime DC watcher and political dynamo Joe Schaefer is here to help us figure out just what this new year holds welcome back to the show joe hello mark so joe we have the congressional elections coming up this year and Anyone who tells they're not campaigning already is clearly lying through their teeth. But what's the message from the contenders of all political stripes? Well, if you're a Democrat, it's Joe Biden who? Uh, I don't know this guy. I have nothing to do with this guy. You're going to see uh, now that we're into 2022, more and more people distan distancing themselves from his administration and what they're about. And, you know, I think it's going to be very interesting. You know, are they going to try and get Kamala Harris out on the campaign trail? Will people want her on the campaign trail uh, with her popularity? So Democrats are going to be running away from Joe Biden. Republicans are going to be bringing him up every chance they get. He's their best weapon. They know it. Democrats know it. The whole country knows it. And so it's going to be Democrats running away from Joe Biden and Republicans bringing him up every single chance they have. I think a lot of people are wondering, Joe, what's happened to the America First movement? It's belittled in the press, uh, deemed dangerous by a number of politicos. What's the reality? The reality is that is still the driving force in the grassroots of the Republican Party. And there is still a Republican establishment in Washington, D.C., in elected office that has always been opposed to this grassroots and doesn't want to be part of this grassroots. And so you still have this divide between the Republican base and the Republican elected officials. And I think it's very worrisome for the America First movement. Donald Trump went down that escalator in the summer of 2015. He was in the White House for four years. And I have, I just don't believe they have cultivated enough America first candidates to be running for these offices. I think it's extremely worrisome that in a crucial state like Pennsylvania in 2022, U.S. Senate race, you're finally getting rid of Pat Toomey, who most America first MAGA people consider a rhino, consider him just a chamber of commerce guy, kind of Republican they need to move on from. And this is what you're facing up to in 2022. Dr. Mehmet Oz, who considers Arnold Schwarzenegger a Republican role model, and his $100 million net worth trying to purchase the seat, and his most likely top 
candidate had not announced yet, but he's expected to announce uh, is Bridgewater CEO David McCormick, who has a net worth that's way more than $100 million. They're one of the most globalist, the biggest hedge fund in the world, I believe, does all kinds of business with China. So six years after Donald Trump uh, for, you know, wins the White House, the Republican Party in Pennsylvania, the America First voters have to choose between two money guys trying to buy the seat who have no attachment to MAGA, no I, I, idea of America First. It's really the, you wonder, is the Republican establishment succeeding in trying to take back the, the party from what they are hoping is a brief aberration of the Donald Trump years. Okay, so what do you think will sway the ballot box this time around? And is Joe Biden hoping for some kind of economic miracle to swoop in and save him from those who are already starting to reject him in the polls? It's so strange because I've said many times and I've felt all along, Joe Biden does not care about being popular. Joe Biden has an agenda to push, and I think it's a destructive agenda. And I think he realizes he is never going to be popular. But if you're a Democrat running for elected office, this is, that's, that's not going to help you at all. That's terrible. So I really do think it's not going to change. Biden's not, his popularity is never going to inch up significantly. And if you're a Democrat, you got to get in that bunker, you got to hunker down, and you have to separate yourself from this administration I also strongly believe that this may hurt some rhinos, you know, Republican establishment types who are all closely identified with the swamp. Joe Biden is a swamp careerist. He is going to hurt the uniparty swamp type politician. He will hurt Republicans if they're too closely identified with that. And I always thought Mitch, but Mitch McConnell kind of understands that as well, which is why he's sort of trying to to take it a little easy, you know, as, as 2022 is here. It, it's interesting. I think that the, the grassroots voters desperately want to teach the swamp a lesson. And the dilemma for, Repu for uh, Republicans who want to do that is, do we vote in a swamp Republican to send a message against a swamp Joe Biden? And, you know, that's where you need good candidates and you need to develop these candidates so you don't have these false choices. I wonder if rather than driven campaigning, it will be more of a cultural battleground in a, in a war, a culture war that President Obama says does not exist. Your thoughts? Well, that worries me because that's where the um, careerists really know how to manipulate the public. You know, and when, if they make it about hot button issues that get people excited, like critical race theory, or even the coronavirus divide. Someone who has no genuine interest in serving the people, just wants to get in there and serve his lobbyists, can say, I am against the vaccine mandates, and you elect me, I am going to fight for that. And we'll get overwhelming support from many Republicans, but doesn't have to sincerely believe that and can backtrack as soon as they get elected. And, and you can see Democrats saying, I am going to push for vaccine mandates. I am going to, we are going to, you know, make this, this country safer. And they can be just beaten in for their, their corporate lobbyists. So even Democratic voters can be hoodwinked here. Republican voters can be hoodwinked here. If it's going to be a culture hot button thing, I just think the, that it plays right to the, the Uniparty's hands. They, they've been manipulating these things forever. And it's, it is incumbent. Democrat, Republican voters, vet your candidates, find out what they really stand for and don't fall for hot button, uh, e e easy words that, you know, that, that don't have to be backed up once they get into office. Joe Schaefer, thank you ever so much. Thank you. You're listening to Liberty Nation Radio, heard across the Radio America network from our flagship station in the nation's capital, WWRC in Washington, D.C. And remember, you can tune in for Liberty Nation from 2 to 3 p.m. Sunday on KBKW 103.5 FM or 1450 AM, the talk of Grays Harbor. Later in the show, we're going to figure out just what the future holds for the Second Amendment. Coming up next, though, we have a special Say What segment with Tim Donner. Don't touch that dial. America is free. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of enterprise. 
and freedom is special and rare. This is Liberty Nation with Mark Angelides, a production of LibertyNation.com, going after what the politicians really mean and making it all clear for your freedom and your liberty. Liberty Nation with Mark Angelides. Sometimes the politicos and their supporters in the fourth estate let on far more than they know. Damned by their own words, if you will. From the sublimely ridiculous to the tone deaf, these travelers in the political sphere are always more than willing to let slip the most riotous and damnable things. And sometimes there's the occasional bright spark who tells the story exactly as it is. Now, we're very lucky to have longtime host of this here radio show and senior political analyst for LibertyNation.com, Mr. Tim Donner, to host our special Year End Say What Signature segment. Now, Tim has been gathering the grandest and most grimace inducing comments from the major players of 2021. Buckle up, it's going to get very, very bumpy. Tim, thanks for being here. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Mark. And as we look ahead to 2022, we also bid farewell to a year in which a triumphant new president addressed the nation on July 4th, proclaiming victory over COVID-19, fulfilling his campaign promise that he would end the once every century pandemic only to see his presidency come apart at the seams a month later with a resurgent virus and an ill-conceived, disastrous surrender in Afghanistan, the effects of which this president has yet to shake off, a border crisis of his own making, a crime wave across urban America, an inflation which has grown from a concern to a fear as his approval falls as low as the 30s in three separate polls approaching year's end. The most painful of the problems Joe Biden carries over from the old year to the new is inflation, which serves as a tax on every financial transaction by every single person in the country. It's now up near 7 percent. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell finally admitted near the end of the year that transitory is no longer an appropriate description of the problem. And Charles Payne of Fox Business says shame on him for suggesting for so long that it is. It's embarrassing for the Federal Reserve, you know, the the folks who are in charge of our money to be this wrong this long. This inflation issue is not going to go away overnight. It's persistent and it's insidious. In the Dallas area, you have the highest prices ever paid for raw materials ever. Wages are going up and they're at the highest prices, the place at the spike that they've been. More money goes into the system. Prices go up and the person out there, the average person is getting nowhere. So the check looks a little bit bigger and it is. But the simplest way to understand this is you actually go in the store with more money in your pocket and come out with fewer bags. Unless and until inflation is brought to heel, there's no chance Joe Biden's approval will rise, especially now that COVID has reared its head again with what looks like another winter onslaught. Now, even though vaccine mandates in blue states have produced higher death rates than in mandate-free red states, The power-hungry control freaks on the left can best be typified by the utterly clueless financial commentator on his CNBC, famous for being wrong in most all of his financial predictions, now straying into areas he knows nothing about and calling for the most extreme measures, Jim Cramer. It's time to admit that we have to go to war against COVID. Require vaccination universally. Have the military run it. If you don't want to get vaccinated, you better be ready to prove your conscientious objector status in court. And even then, you need to help in the war effort by staying home until we finally beat this thing. I knew you wouldn't believe me if I didn't play it for you. That complete loser lefty calling for (laughs) using the military to force every American to get vaccinated or go to court or stay home until they do get the jab. It's that kind of thinking that has the Democrats in general and this 46th president in particular sucking swamp water, as they say, in the polls. But the one thing that united the left these last years was Donald Trump, and they're at it again, scaring people with the dystopian vision of a restored Trump in the Oval Office. And who better to sound the alarm than the woman who certain Trump stole the election from her in 2016 and is now certain he'll be running again. 
I mean, he seems to be setting himself up to do that. And if he's not held accountable, then he gets to do it again. I think that could be the end of our democracy, not to be too you know, pointed about it, but I want people to understand that this is a make or break point. If he were or someone of his ilk were once again to be elected president, and if especially he had a Congress that would do his bidding, you will not recognize our country. Note how she says someone of Trump's ilk, i.e. any candidate who follows the agenda of a former president with overwhelming approval of in his own party, even after the ugliness of 2020. But the left has been concocting all manner of conspiracy theories about the evil orange man. Exhibit A was a recent article in The Atlantic titled, Trump's Next Coup Has Already Begun by Progressive Bart Gelman. January 6th was not an isolated event. It was part of a coherent plan uh, and conspiracy to overthrow uh, the results of the last election uh, that went on uh, for a considerable time uh, before and after January 6th. Republican operatives working on Trump's behalf, they're uh, seeking out all of the public officials who said no to the coup last time, who said, no, we won't change the vote count. They're taking those people and they are either hounding them out of office uh, or they are making them irrelevant by passing new laws uh, that take the power away from that office. So as Donald Trump plots a second coup d'etat, at least in the minds of terrified leftists, criminals are running wild in the streets of progressive-run cities, empowered by defunded and dispirited police, lenient bail and catch-and-release laws. San Francisco Mayor London Breed pretended that making one tough speech will change years of disastrous liberal policies that have destroyed the once great city. And it comes to an end when we take the steps to be more aggressive with law enforcement, more aggressive with the changes in our policies, and less tolerant of all the bull that has destroyed our city. And right after the San Francisco mayor said that, Nancy Pelosi pretended she had no idea what's causing the crime wave. It's absolutely outrageous. Uh, you know, obviously, it cannot continue. Uh, but the fact is that there is an attitude of uh, uh, lawlessness in our country that springs from I don't know where. Your policies, Madam Speaker, your policies. But we close with the speaker's head shaker about our 46th president. Our country could not be more, could not be better served than with this most experienced, capable hands than yours, President Biden. <laughs> It's just perfect. But will Joe Biden be as perfect in 2022 as in 2021, Mark? Back to you. Well, that depends on what one's definition of perfect is, as Bill Clinton might have said. Thanks for being here, Tim, and a very happy new year to you. Well, folks, the show's not over yet. Coming up after this short break, we're talking liberty with Mr. Scott D. Cassenza Esquire. Freedom and your liberty. Liberty Nation with Mark Angelides. Welcome back to a brand new year of Talking Liberty here on Liberty Nation Radio. What does the year hold ahead for the constitutionally minded folk out there in the great United States? Will abortion finally be settled law? Will the Second Amendment be strengthened or weakened? Well, to answer these questions and a great many others, we welcome back legal affairs editor and uprising podcast host, Mr. Scott D. Casenza. Esquire to give us a preview of the year ahead. Happy New Year to you, Scott. Cheers, Mark, and Happy New Year to you. And this is a coffee cup, but there's not coffee inside it. I won't say if there's champagne in there or not, but uh, cheers in any case. Absolutely. Now, Scott, I have to start off with the, the simple questions. We're looking uh, into this year for the Supreme Court. We're looking for decisions on abortion and gun cases. Give me the details. The, uh, the Mississippi abortion case, whether or not pre-viability restrictions on abortion are going to be allowed. Basically, this is the case that people are hoping and or fearing that will overturn Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey, the two major uh, landmark legal decisions in that, in that area. That's to be expected. 
late spring, sometime before the court breaks for its summer recess. The other one is the uh, New York State rifle and pistol case, which concerns the issuance of uh, permits or licenses to carry firearms and whether or not uh, the states have to apply a kind of uh, universal standard towards uh, those applicants or whether they can just grant them to their friends and their brother-in-laws and people who give them campaign contributions, which is how it works uh, in New York. So will issue versus may issue, yeah? Actually, yeah, that's exactly right. We say shall issue. So generally it's, it's may issue versus shall issue. And that case will also, along with the abortion case, both of those cases have been argued as we've, as we've discussed previously on uh, Liberty Nation Radio, and they will be decided uh, sometime uh, in, in 2022. Okay, now, Scott, there's another thing that you brought to my attention. This is Shirtliff versus the city of Boston. I think this is a pretty interesting one for our listeners. Care to give us the rundown? Boston has three flagpoles at its city hall. One flies the United States flag, Old Glory. One flies the Commonwealth of Massachusetts state flag. And the third flagpole was put up and, and allowed for people in Boston to fly whatever flag they wanted to, to celebrate some cause or event or something like that. And from uh, 2005 to 2017, the city approved every single request it got, which was 284 requests to fly different flags. And then came the first denial when uh, a group called Camp Constitution, which is a religious volunteer organization, asked to fly a flag featuring the red Latin cross to commemorate Constitution Day. Well, that was just too much free speech for uh, for for the uh, the city fathers of uh, of Boston to allow, and they said they would not allow a religious flag. Quote: This is so great, out of concern for the so-called separation of church and state. So, it, it it's just I'm laughing because you know it's a it seems to be Mark a crystal clear violation of the right to free speech because it's a content based uh, restriction on free speech uh, and also. Uh, you know, a religious based uh, content exclusion on free speech because they approved all of the non-religious messages that were asked to be flown and then are restricting this religious one. I, I don't think they're going to be granted uh, protection under uh, some sort of, you know, uh, separation of church and state thing. I, I hope and think this will be stricken down as an impermissible imposition on free speech. So presumably here, the remedy, Scott, should this go in the uh, in Shirtliff's favor, is that a the flag will be flown uh, at, at the Boston City Hall for at least one day, and then b that the city of Boston will be less likely to uh, try and restrict any liberties under the five precepts, uh, the five tenets of the First Amendment. Well, for for the second part of your question, uh, I wouldn't be uh, confident that the Pauls in Boston are going to go ahead and give conservatives and Republicans and people who are non-liberals or progressives any kind of, uh, you know, fair hearing when it comes to their rights. So I don't know that that's true. And actually, for the first part of your uh, the, the supposition that they, they will be forced to fly, I don't think that's necessarily true. That's called specific performance, which is not always granted in lawsuits. More than likely, uh, it'll be uh, damages, uh, money damages that they have to pay, or they can, uh, and or they they will have to fly the flag. One of the things we've seen uh, in the past, Mark, is when these uh, these petty tyrants don't get their way, they'll they'll bulldoze that third uh, that third flagpole, and uh, nobody gets to fly it after after everybody's ruled to have been had to have equal access to it. Well, they'll just have to take down the uh, flag of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for a day, won't they? So mm -hmm. another, another uh, issue that I want to discuss for the coming year, there's the Federal Election Commission versus Ted Cruz for Senate. Now, this is Ted Cruz, not the man himself, but the, 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 presumably the super PAC or the organization behind his next election bid. <clears throat> well, it's actually both. He's one of the, uh, he's one of the named folks in, in, in the suit. Mark, I'm always... Uh fascinated when somebody sets out to get a case before the Supreme Court, uh, not when it's in an, in an advanced appellate st stature, but when it's just getting started and they succeed. And that's what Ted Cruz has done here. The Federal Election Commission has many regulations that seemingly uh, trample on the First Amendment. And this is, I think, one of them. Uh, it, it's not necessarily a big deal for you know most folks, but for candidates for office, it is a big deal. And the regulation here is that 
candidates often loan money to their campaign. So they want to start, you want to run for office in the United States. Ted Cruz wants to run for Senate. He needs to spend money to do so, to win. And fundraising isn't as successful early on when that's really when it makes the most difference. There's a saying called um, early money is like yeast. It makes the dough rise. So the earlier you the, that a candidate gets money, the more successful their candidacy is going to be. So there's an impetus to fund it early. So candidates often loan their campaigns this money. And this regulation concerns how long uh, the, the campaign has to pay them back uh, and the amount that they can pay them back. And so what Ted Cruz did in order to get this law challenged before the Supreme Court was the day before the election, he loaned his campaign, I think it was $260,000. Now, the rule said that they couldn't pay back more than two fifty. So this only concerns ten thousand dollars, which in the, the scheme of the Texas uh, senatorial race is, is a drop in the bucket. But that's what we're talking about. But it was engineered to get before the Supreme Court, and uh, they're going to rule if this uh, if this regulation is a, an imposition on free speech. I think it is, um, and uh, and we'll have to see what the what the court says. It's uh, it's good publicity for Senator Cruz to be holding a case before the Supreme Court, especially as elections are not too far away. I think that ten thousand dollars is money well spent for him. Now, one more case I'd like to discuss, Scott, is Conception versus the United States. I think this is a pretty fascinating one. What's the deal? This case, Mark, has to do with whether or not somebody who is uh, criminally so Mr. Conception was convicted of. Uh, uh, having crack in 2009, I think in 2010, the sentencing uh, for that same, those same crimes was changed radically and reduced radically. Uh, You know, he got a 20 year sentence, I think for, for crack cocaine. And then when they changed the law, they, they, they drastically reduced the sentence. And then I think it was 2018 when they passed another law that said that people who had been sentenced previous to the law's sentencing change should have their sentences or could have their sentences adjusted and reviewed. Mr. Conception filed a request for the federal court to have his sentence reduced, uh, commensurate with the new sentencing guidelines that were passed a year after his conviction. And the court looked at the law and said, no, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to reduce your sentence. And the question is, does he have by legal right, does he have the right to have his sentence reduced under that law? And I think it's uh, fascinating. I haven't looked at and I don't know if this number has been published. Actually, I did look for it and, and don't know if it's been published, which is the sheer number of the many, many people in federal prison who are there for drug crimes, you know, how many of this affects. But surely it's well beyond just Mr. Conception, uh, the number of people who are sitting in prison now who, if they were convicted for the same crime, but after 2010, would be out of prison because of the way that the sentencing guidelines have changed. I think we'll be following this story quite closely, Scott. Well, I want to thank you for giving us a, uh, an overview of the year ahead. Much appreciated. And I wish you all the best in 2022, Scott. And to you and to all the listeners as well, Mark, I, uh, I, I share the sentiment. Cheers. Cheers. And that's about it for this episode of Liberty Nation Radio here on the Radio America Network. I'd like to thank our guests for appearing on this special New Year show, economist and author Andrew Moran, writer Joe Schaefer, constitutional expert Scott Casenza, and our very sincere gratitude to longtime host of this here show, Tim Donner, for his entertaining and enlightening signature Say What Roundup. And let's not forget you, the constant listener. Thanks for being here and making everything worthwhile. I'll leave you with a couple of thoughts on the new year. This is often a time that we make resolutions. Some of us let them slip by before the snow has even melted, and others have cast them off as a bad idea and just don't make them anymore. After all, as the saying goes, we can change our lives and our outlooks in the fraction of a second on the turning of a dime, literally at any single moment during the year. But in defense of New Year's resolutions, it seems to me that the very universe is acting in congruence with us when we make a personal pledge as the year turns. The Earth has decided to start its long trek around the sun once more. The very seasons have made the choice to begin again, and the nature that surrounds is getting set for a second chance at life. G.K. Chesterton wrote, The object of a new year is not that we should have a new year. It is that we should have a new soul and a new nose, new feet, a new backbone, new ears and new eyes. Unless a particular man made New Year's resolutions, he would make no resolutions. 
unless a man starts afresh about things, he will certainly do nothing effective, end quote. And for me, this is the beating heart of New Year's resolutions. We should not be looking to make subtle adjustments, but to make sweeping changes. If only in attitude alone, we must recommit ourselves to that which is important with a, a gusto that leaves those watching on in silent awe. We don't have to learn a new skill or get better at housekeeping to make a significant positive change in our lives. When we recommit to those that we love, when we determine that from this moment on, our hearts will be given over to the people or ideals that burn for us, well, that's the greatest resolution possible. That's what makes history.